watch this, I'm going to really blow you away with this. This was just a song in a film, and her performance is the reason. It's the most perfect marriage of a song and an artist that's ever been. When Mama sang Over the Rainbow, she believed in the sentiment of the song with all of her heart. That's why whenever you hear the song, even today, you think of her. It was that personal. It sounds inconceivable, but Over the Rainbow is cut from the film after the second preview. It slows down the picture, some executives complain, and they consider it undignified for an MGM star to sing in a barnyard. But good sense finally prevails, and the song is restored. While the movie shuts down to recast Buddy Epson's part, Mervyn Leroy studies the results of the first two weeks of shooting. Leroy feels that director Richard Thorpe's footage lacks the childlike quality the film needs, and Thorpe is reassigned. Director George Cukor has a few days open before starting Gone with the Wind and agrees to help out. He too is appalled at what he sees. He begins altering makeup and costumes for many of the principals. Hugh particularly dislikes Judy Garland's appearance. He takes off her curly blonde wig and half of her makeup. And, he recalls, I told her to remember that she's just a little girl from Kansas. George Hugh departs, never realizing how valuable his unsung efforts will be to the final film. And now Leroy makes a surprising decision. He chooses Victor Fleming to take over. Now, Fleming is a tough-talking, no-nonsense director who goes biking and big game hunting with his buddy, Clark Gable. Despite this macho image, Fleming finds the project irresistible. I made the film, he says, because I wanted my two little girls to see a picture that searched for beauty and decency and sweetness and love in the world. Fleming works tirelessly on this difficult project. Then only a few weeks before completion, he is abruptly summoned to the Selznick Studios. There is trouble in Tara. On the Gone with the Wind set, Clark Gable and George Cukor are barely speaking. Gable threatens to quit unless producer David O. Selznick borrows his pal Victor Fleming. Selznick gets MGM to agree. Cukor is out and Fleming is in. King Vito, one of Hollywood's finest filmmakers, will provide the finishing touches on Oz. Sometimes we, we being in the studio and knowing the director, and uh, the studio would ask to ask you to take over. And so then they said, well, would you take over Wizard of Oz? And so I would, and I went over and picked the funny with a good friend and took me around all the sets to run through the thing. And one day, he left. And I took over. It's about, as I remember, it's about two and a half weeks, three weeks possibly, which included the Somewhere Over the Rainbow. But I did not want any credit, and as long as Victor was alive, I kept quiet about it. Another element of Oz falls into place when over a hundred little people march into MGM. The first and last time that such a unique gathering would take place. They are billed as the singer midgets, but many are freelancers from vaudeville and circuses all over the world. Only a few are rowdy, most are enthusiastic, and studio workers will never forget them. Munchkin memories are very special. The young man in the middle is Jerry Marin. to welcome you to Munchkin Land. And that's what I had as Judy Garland, the lollipop. I was 17, and uh, prior to this, I'd never seen a little man or person in my life or a little woman. And I was all excited because uh, I heard there were going to be quite a few little men and women. And we got on the bus, but I seen all of them. I said, oh, I was so excited. Little guys just like me. And I watch how they walk and I watch how they talk. And it was exciting. I said, my goodness, here I am in Hollywood for the first time in pictures and with the biggest studio. Well, when we met the casting director, he took a look at us and he picked about eight of us to say the lines of the Munchkin Corner. I probably enunciated 
a little bit more distinctly or more emphatically than some of the others. So she says, okay, you're the coroner. And then, of course, Adrian, the gentleman who is in charge of costumes, measured every single munchkin and designed an individual costume for each person so that it took the costume department about five weeks to make up all these costumes, during which time we were rehearsing. So as soon as the costumes were ready, we were ready to start shooting. Jack Dawn took each one of us and said, well, now what is your part? What are your lines? And then he would put on a makeup for us. And then as soon as he was finished with us, they would take a still shot, and that was put in the file. And then each other munchkin who had a speaking part was likewise done a master makeup by Jack Dawn and put in the file so that when we were ready to shoot, all they had to do was take that picture out of the file and one of the assistant makeup men would put on the same uh, whiskers and beard so that we would be the, have the same appearance every day that we were on the set.